Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features Weapon X and number four, cover dated June 1995. The cover is by Adam Kubert, penciled and inked by him. I always prefer when an artist inks their own works. And this looks excellent to me. It's quite an action-oriented cover here. We have Weapon X with the huge hair, the black gums, the forearm here and the twisting muscle and sinew in that forearm. Really great attention to detail. Punching through this cyborg, whoever that could be. And what's this peeping through the back of this guy's shirt here at the top? What could it be? Is this cover a bit of a spoiler? Well, let's open this one up to the splash page. And we do indeed get a splash page to begin. And the setting is Eurasia. We don't know exactly where the Human High Council are at the opening of this issue, but we'll discover that they've moved from London to elsewhere. And there is this holographic computer display of the Great Culling and Gateway, who has been brought from Central Europe to the Human High Council in order to direct the Armada laden with nuclear weapons to wipe out uh, Apocalypse's North America, is here being shown what has been going on with these infinites culling human beings. And he says, this is the human condition. The species has always practiced genocide. Philistines and Trojans wiped off the face of the earth, the Easter Islanders, for the greater part of human history, it was de rigueur. And Weapon X here just says to him, I'll give you de rigueur. <laughs> it's so good, uh, Larry Hama's dialogue. And I, I like the nonchalant, uh, unmoved look on um, Gateway's face there as he smokes a cigarette. This is Emma Frost, of course, here in the foreground. So let's continue with the story. And we have Weapon X yanking Gateway to take a look at this poor girl um, who's about to be culled by this massive infinite. And um, Gateway begins to get the picture. He says, look here, Logan, this is distasteful. I understand what went on here, so there's no need to. And Weapon X just forces him to look at the girl after she's been shot and murdered. Yeah, you know all about the about statistics and that old, cold, abstract, intellectual concept of death. But you ain't never seen the Reaper Man up close, have you? So Gateway's forced to look at this girl. And uh, Logan continues and says, you ain't never seen the warm light fade from the eyes. Never seen a person who could laugh cry and dream turn to meet right in front of you. I had the text do a digital map of her diary so I could pick it up like this, which is what he's doing. I ain't asking you to, for, to do it for the faceless millions. I'm asking you to do it for Jody Craig, who's never gonna see 17. You wanna read the great books of Mankind Gateway? You read Jody's diary and read her joys and her sorrows, her expectations and wonderment. And then you look me in the eye and tell me you're gonna write her off. So then the holographic computer display fades out and Gateway says, Logan, you're one cold son of a... And Logan interrupts as he pulls off, bites off the end of a cigar. Yes, sir, I surely am. That's what comes of being short, hairy un and unloved. So a great opening sequence here. In terms of the art, what I really uh, like in this particular panel is... And what's interesting in the panel is the decision here by Adam Kubert. He's inked by Dan Green to uh, ink in the white of Gateway's eyes there, ink them in black, have the iris in white and the pupil in black. And even the lighting here, the up lighting on Gateway's face and the murdered girl's face, you can see the highlighting of the eyelashes on Gateway there and also on the girl. That's really, really interesting attention to detail and particularly um, distinctive of Adam Kubert's style. And of course, the whole business with Jodie Craig is that she's obviously an analogue of Anne Frank. And there is, and so Larry Hama is bringing in that um, subtext here to this particular scene. And I like the way that, you know, Gateway was enjoying his cigarette, but he loses it there. And now Logan um, is about to spark up his own cigar. So, you know, this is all in the era pre Joe Quesada and Bill uh, Jemas and their. Uh, dictate that Marvel uh, characters don't smoke because, you know, the kids might um, begin to take up smoking themselves, which is just stupid, but in any case. So the title of this story, great double page spread here, title of the story is Into the Maelstrom, 
and the creative team Larry Hama script, Adam Kubert pencils, Dan Green inks, Pat Brousseau letters, and Joe Rosas colors with digital chameleon on separations. Something I want to point out here about Joe Rosas's coloring is the way that he's using it for the computer effects here um, of like the background here. So the, the characters and the scene here in the background is just slightly uh, faded out, but not too much. Whereas Glynis Oliver, who's new to the digital coloring game in Factor X, she overdid it on her first couple of issues of Factor X, but Joe Rosas, just a little bit more skilled with the computer, with the use of what computer coloring tools allows one to do, um, in my view here in this particular issue. So again, this double page spread, just fantastic. Logan striking the match off his um, stump there and the lighting in the hair and just all the detail in the hair there. Perfect combination of penciler and inker, uh, Adam Kubert and Dan Green. We've got uh, Brian Braddock there, who in this Age of Apocalypse reality uh, was never uh, made into Captain Britain by Merlin. So a different, uh, just a purely human Brian Braddock. We've got Mariko Yashida there as well and never had a relationship with Wolverine. And here we've got Gateway saying, um, I've studied mankind long enough to know that our greatest sin has been to learn nothing from our mistakes. So if you'll accept an abashed mea culpa from a reformed pedant, I'm now prepared to shepherd your air flotilla from the city of light to the dominion of darkness. So that's what he said in the previous issue. Logan got him to agree to come to the Human High Council for them to make a case to him and then he'd make a decision about whether he'd go or not. So this is where the flotilla is now, no longer over London, but over Paris or the remains, the remains rather of Paris. So we've got the wrecked Eiffel Tower there and another Paris landmark. We have Notre Dame there uh, wrecked and burnt out, uh, which is a bit ironic in terms of what happened at Notre Dame. A couple of um, not Notre Dame, Notre Dame, um, a couple of years ago, uh, I think 2020, during yeah the first year of the pandemic. So, oh, and great uh, rim lighting here on Logan as well with the uh, hairs on his arm here, just uh, delineated in um, white media also by Dan Green. Really, really nice work. So let's continue with the story. The scene switches to New York City, Manhattan. This is uh, Apocalypse's Citadel. He's just done um, talking uh, with Magneto and he's leaving his uh, men there to torture Magneto. And then we have Rex here, his factotum, his personal assistant, giving an update on what's going on in Europe. He says the airship Armada is no longer in London. It might be regrouping or it might even be en route to attack us. So obviously, the, like Apocalypse doesn't have spy satellites good enough to uh, determine where the flotilla is or there must be some um, anti-satellite detect detection technology that uh, the flotilla is using, um, the flotilla manufactured by Braddock Industries. But Apocalypse is unconcerned. There's also some a point there about Mikhail Rasputin, the missing horseman, um, who's not been reported in, who has not reported in on his arrival in London, and that is um, story material that's dealt with in X Universe X or X Universe number two. Um, Rex says to him as he descends this spiral staircase, perhaps it would be prudent to intensify the vigilance of our perimeter platforms. But Apocalypse is nonchalant. He says, I think not Rex. And why would that be? Well, he says the players are all in place for the end game. I'm curious to see how it plays out. Whoever wins will justify their genetic superiority, won't they? Uh, um, and so that's so interesting because Apocalypse, that's what he's about. That's his one credo. It is might is right and the strong will uh, conquer the weak. That's what he's about. So he doesn't really care about anything other than that. And then we've got this weird business of this uh, genetic experimentation and technological experimentation on human and mutant subject there with this creature in the vat. Apocalypse here says, yesterday there were two distinct humans in that vat, one with enhanced hands and the new techno-organic strain and one uninfected human with a restructured cranium. We tossed in the plasma pistol just for effect. That's mounted here on the arm, disgustingly. The vat tanks think it eats its own surplus parts. So... 
just a bit of body horror there as well in the midst of everything and then we're back to Paris and the flotilla high above the city the remains of the city you can see it cratered there uh, with uh, uh, you know uh, the, the, the scars of um, a previous battle the Seine running through the middle of the city there as well and um, we have Gateway now piloting the flotilla and he, there's a weather report there's a storm out over the Atlantic and Gateway commands that uh, the flotilla alter course to intersect the storm and he's determined that they use it as, as cover and that he should be able to navigate he says between their main sensors uh, that's apocalypses because a severe electrical storm in that latitude will wreak havoc with their instruments he says i don't know exactly how i'm going to get us all through but i'm going to do it but not for that jody girl in the hologram he says no i'll do it for carol danvers so carol was killed in the previous issue or so it seemed so wolverine here stoic says hey you got your guilt i got mine now i'm gonna i gotta check i uh, gotta check on the council so he's going down um into the bowels of the airship and we get catch the tail end of a conversation here between emma frost and brian braddock where she is worried about why he's aboard um she says here you should not be on board you're indispensable to the council you're the one who designed most of the equipment but he says that's the very reason he should be there but carol says or sorry not carol um emma frost says quietly something's not right about him to, to logan and logan says mariko said the same thing what's with all the suspicion about him anyway and this has been seeded since the first issue of the series if he was stooging for apocalypse would he be on this airship if he sold us out this ship would be target numero uno that would be suicidal wouldn't it and emma concludes and then she goes too far by saying a suicidal is coming on board if you thought your former soulmate had run off to warn the, warn the enemy of our plans so he's got nothing to say to that and then after a pause he says come take a walk with me miss frost as he continues to smoke his cigar so then we go down into deeper into the bowels of the airship where the nuclear armament armaments are the weapons bay and he says that jean she's a pistol and a firecracker in a fight but i know there just ain't no hardening her heart to do the likes of this no ma'am no way i surely hope she still loves me as much as i love her but i love her so much you see that i know her heart and what i know tells me she'll storm heaven and hell to stop this here hard rain from falling and emma responds what i said before was mean beyond words i'm so sorry so this is a different character for emma frost in this age of apocalypse reality the emma frost of the regular reality wouldn't apologize for anything like that you know she was a snarky sarcastic uh, dry witted character but this one has maybe had her own share of trauma which is hinted at by the scar on her uh, the side of her head and uh, logan says back to her what it's like for me miss frost me who's going to help pitch these down right on top of her so wolverine's sticking to his guns in terms of his determination that apocalypse be nuked off the face of north america now we've got to turn this double page spread sideways look at that so really adam kubert just having great fun with the art in the weapon x series he's really going for it in this series and manages to do all four issues and do a tremendous job on them that's a great um uh, foreshortened angle on on gateway there where we're basically in the foreground is his face and wolverine's coming after him so he's up on the prow of the airship piloting it from outside so emma's worried about that brian braddock too she says here he's up on the prow and gateways there as the ship is about to uh, plunge into the storm front yeah just tremendous art and imagination from adam kuber and then we get some action so you know um a pretty slow start to this issue when mostly weapon x uh the the series has been you know uh, um tremendous uh action um from start to finish so a little bit of a slow start to this issue but now we're at the action part so this strange flying creature um, flies right over the prow of the ship and who does it turn out to be except donald pierce so this is a guy that just won't stay down 
So he's back again and he's calling into the uh, infin infinites on the Atlantic Sea security platforms. So he informs them about the flotilla and uh, uh, lights a beacon for them to zero in on. So basically they send out their interceptors, these uh, jets, uh, to attack the flotilla if it's out there. And here we have a great anchor image of Pierce smashing through uh, the windshield of the airship. And who is this in silhouette here with the wings and the guns blasting away? And this is an interesting little bit here. Um, Emma Frost calls through uh, to Gateway, telling him that they need Logan down on the bridge because they've been boarded. And Braddock says, tell him it's Pierce. And Frost replies, how, do you, how did you know that? Well, we're going to get a little bit of a reveal here regarding Pierce. But first of all, another great double page spread sideways. Just look at the, your eye just goes straight to this kind of angel of death figure and Wolverine getting shot in the right arm. Gateway here, up on the hull of the ship. All the ink splatter and white media that Dan Green here is using to give us the effect of the lightning storm, the storm that they've steered into. Yeah, this is great, great stuff. So it's Donald Pierce. And it turns out that Braddock is a double agent. He's been working for Apocalypse. He apologizes to Emma even as he punches her out and grins here as he heads up to the helm. And Pierce instructs him, we'll turn a beam of the wind and bring the Armada to a dead stop. So up on the, uh, the, the prow of the ship, this angel of death figure alights and who does it turn out to be except for Carol Danvers? So somehow she survived the grenade explosion in the previous issue. And Logan implores her, don't do it. Look what they've done to you. What, that's what the whole world's going to be like if she kills Gateway. So then we're back down into the, in the bridge where Emma Frost has picked up an axe. And she's going after Pierce and... Um, Braddock and we get an explanation as to how it is he's a traitor and it is because he was fitted with an organic cerebral cortex implant so Pierce says the High Lord has long arms so he instructs Brian to blow her away but he resists and he blasts Pierce out the window but Pierce his uh, long uh, cyborg arms reach back in and punch right through Brian's back. So you couldn't do that to Captain Britain, but Brian Braddock, without those Captain Britain powers, is vulnerable and he dies. He says here, he gets a little kind of death scene. I couldn't do it, Emma. In the end, I was only human. And that's a great choice there by Adam Kubert to leave this particular panel, um, uh, panel without a border and just the small figure of Emma uh, leaning over the dead body of Brian. That's really well done. And she gets to use that axe cutting through uh, Pierce's uh, cyborg uh, techno arm there as well. Nicely done. And let's continue. So out on top of the, the hull of the ship, we have Carol Danvers. So she's been transformed. We got a little explanation from her of what happened, how she could have survived. She says the grenade tore her and Pierce apart, but he infected me with whatever he's got this techno-organic virus, and he put us back together using parts from the other altered humans. I'm sharing this body with something loathsome, Logan, and I don't have full control. It's gonna make me shoot Gateway. For pity's sake, Logan, stop me. Do what you have to do. So he says here, he makes the point, my arm is all shut up. Note the rope that he's got tied around his shoulder as well. That'll come into play shortly too. And then Carol is killed by Donald Pierce again, extending these finger claws right through her wings, through her uh, body. And look at him here. This is re really something out of a horror movie as he crawls forward with the blood dripping from his hand. Um, and Logan says that his arm is all shot up. But Pierce follows up and says, my arm is functioning quite nicely, thank you. She was my only way off this death ship. 
but who cares as long as you take the long plunge into darkness with me. So now it's time for some tough guy talk. Logan says, you're going first, Pierce. And Pierce makes the point, oh, come now, what are you going to do, Logan? Bite off my nose? The interceptors are already here, and there they are. Uh, I think I'll snap Gateway's neck just for grins. Uh, you're forcing me to play my whole card, says Logan, here in the foreground, as he lurches forward. His right arm is out of it. And Pierce is mocking. He says, oh, heaven protect me. He's going to stump me to death. And then here we go. The sound effects here. Schluck, shrip, and snicked with blood covering it. So what's happened? We're going to get quite the image when we turn the page. And it's nice that it's on a page turn too. There we go. Out pop the claws from beneath the stump. And he just takes out Pierce with them. Now that's interesting because we don't see them coming out the other side of Pierce. But we get that effect here on the cover. It's a little bit like uh, Frank Miller's uh, Daredevil 181. And when Bullseye stabs Electra with her uh, with her own sigh. And it makes a point through the back of her costume but doesn't come through. So I wonder is this still something that has to do with the Comics Code Authority here. As to why we don't see those claws going right through them. But other than that. This is something that people, like readers, would have been wondering about all along. Okay, so Cyclops blasted off Wolverine, or Logan's hand. But what about the claws? Because they are housed um, um, be, uh, behind the hand in his forearm. So where did they go? Well, they're there all along, apparently. But it also then raises questions. Okay, so he's using them here on Pierce. But is this the first time he's ever had to pop those claws on his, on his left hand? Why wouldn't he have, um, you know, like developed, like worn a costume that allowed him to use the claws on his left hand? So, you know, a little bit of a, a kind of little bit of a puzzle there regarding the choice. Obviously, narratively speaking, uh, Larry Hama made a choice to keep this until the fourth issue. So it's a powerful scene. But it does raise questions as to why Logan Weapon X would have been fighting, um, going into situations without using the claws on his left hand. You tell me what you think about that in the comments to this video. And then one last double page spread. Turn this one sideways. So we're at the end of the issue. Pierce is out of it. And Logan says there, I guess the final joke's on us, Gateway. We're going down in a hail of hot plasma because those interceptors are attacking the flotilla. But Gateway runs to Wolverine, grabs the rope from him, and spins it like a whirly gig, a bull roarer, and says, I can generate, he's hoping he can generate a space-time vortex big enough for the whole armada to slip through. And he does it there, so we see it. So again, just great art and imagination from Andy Kubert. And again, more of that ink splatter and cutting, and cutting in of white media from Dan Green on the inks. And Joe Rosas's colors complementing the black line art perfectly. Not overwhelming it, just really complementing it really well. You know, with what in the, old, uh, in, in the older 1980s coloring would have been color holes here uh, for the effects of uh, the smoke here and the swinging whirly gig there. But it just all works so well. So we get a little bit of tough guy dialogue from Logan at the end here. This is a great uh, panel of him with his chin jutted forward, his teeth gritted. He says here, I wish I could say I was happy about this gateway. Because in some ways I was hoping we'd get shot down with our payload of death. But if it's in my stars to bring this war to apocalypse, then let's get on with it. Because doomsday is coming. So next... You must read X-Men Omega for the stunning conclusion. So all the various uh, threads in the different series are coming together and are going to uh, get tied up together in X-Men Omega. So I do hope that you have enjoyed this review and commentary on Weapon X number four. If you did, please like the video on YouTube. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.